Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the first letter to the Corinthians, verse by verse, and we just finished chapter 9, and we're going to begin looking at chapter 10. I want to thank you all, the continue, all of you who continue to uh, participate with us uh, in these studies as we feast upon God's Word. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, so, so aware of just how little we know. We just long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. We just thank you for everything that you are in our lives. We thank you for your guidance, for your direction. We thank you for your Holy Spirit who guides us, directs us, comforts us. I just ask that, that you would filter out all that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now, I repeat again, as I do so often, and I know people really do, they must be, get tired of hearing it, but this is God's Word. It's not Paul's Word. It is the Word of God. It is the revelation of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we need to keep that in mind as we study it. Much of modern Bible teaching leaves one with the idea that Paul is arguing this or that, and it's, it's sort of time-oriented by his convictions. That is not true. This is God speaking through Paul. One of the interesting uh, things about the chapter divisions here is that there, well, there really isn't any. Another interesting thing about chapter divisions is the way that the chapters tie together. And sometimes the chapter division interrupts our, our train of thought so that we lose the connection. Sort of like the end of chapter 13 in the, the Gospel of John, the Lord says to His disciples, you can't follow Me now. And, and Peter says, well, why can't I follow you? I'll lay down my life for you. And Christ says, you know, will you really? I tell you that truly, Peter, before the cock crows three times, thou shalt deny me thrice. Okay, That's, That was a command by God. Deny me. By the end of the chapter, you go, to, you go to bed, you go to sleep. Next night, well, you know, let not your heart be troubled. You believe uh, in God, believes, believe also into me. And I believe there's a direct connection with what he said to Peter. You're going to deny me three times. And let not your heart be troubled. It's, so that's pretty much what we're looking at here as we leave one chapter for another here. Uh, we ended the ninth chapter, and we've, uh, we've ended that discussion. I mean, you know, so we start really talking about something new, and, and I don't think so. The connective here is gar in the Greek. First word is gar. Gamma, alpha, rho. And there's various translations of that word gar, but the word gar in the Greek literally means for, and it's a direct connective to the preceding verse, but we sometimes miss that in our study of Scripture because uh, we are uh, prone to divide the Word of God into chapters and verses. So I think that's important to see that as we move forward in our study here. We're looking at the liberty of the believer, and the question became, what, uh, what should we do if we violate the conscience of another brother? And I spent some time talking about that. And the emphasis was made by the Holy Spirit that these are Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ for whom Christ died. He died in their place. He died in their place just as He died in your place. His love for them is just as intense as His love is for you. And yet we judge them. We judge them because of their convictions. We, we ridicule their, their conscience. We, we have various opinions of other Christians. You know, some, some we really, really like. They're, they're like, you know, they're really Christ-like. And then, you know, there are some of them, you know, it's, I doubt, well, I doubt they really even know the Lord. And... And we have our own process of judgment, but as far as we know, they are members of the body of Christ, and we should fellowship that way. 
If they're not, well, it'll turn out eventually that they're really not our brothers and sisters in Christ. And the argument ha has been made by the Holy Spirit that we sin against Christ when we cause another brother or sister in Christ to sin against their conscience. It actually is a sin against Christ. That's a serious thing. And so we had the ninth chapter on how the Holy Spirit used Paul. You know, to the weak I became weak, to the Jews I became uh, as a Jew, to, to those under the law as under the law, to those without law as without law, and so forth. And, and then he says there's a struggle that we're engaged in. And it's, uh, it's likened to a sports event. And I, and I pointed out as best I knew how, you know, the rigorous training that's involved in some sports events. You know, it's unbelievable what people will go through, you know, to win some prize. You know, they never do that for Christ. It's, it's absolutely astounding how many hours in the weight room, you know, the exercise room or the swimming pool or the running track or whatever, you know, to win a temporary prize. And so the chapter ended by the Holy Spirit having Paul say, this is not Paul boasting, okay? This is Paul writing what God wants us to hear. I keep my body under subjection, lest by any means when I preach to others, on how Christ has died for them and what Christ has done, I, I myself should turn out to be disqualified. And I, I believe I pointed out, I ended uh, last time by pointing out that this is not an Arminian text. He's not saying that, you know, that, that he's really struggling to be redeemed and he's concerned that in the, the final analysis, you know, well, he may turn out to be reprobate or not really a child of God, unredeemed you know, a fake, that's not the subject of the sentence. You know, you know, is he proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ correctly or incorrectly? Because he doesn't want to be disqualified. And I want you to think about that for a moment. I believe there's scores of people professing to proclaim the gospel of Christ, and they're going to find out that it wasn't really the gospel I believe that there are scores of people professing to proclaim the truth on how Christians should be saved, that is, delivered, uh, once they are redeemed, uh, how, we, how they should then live, you know, and be delivered from sin, self, the law, the world, Satan, you know, and so on, you know, just to find out that they didn't take heed concerning how that they built on Jesus Christ. We should take heed unto doctrine. We should take heed how we build. Some may build with wood, hay, stubble. Others with gold, silver, precious stone. And I suggested the, the words, lest I myself should be disqualified, has a connection to the believer's judgment at Bema. And now we read, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that, that all our fathers, our fathers, were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And the question, dearly beloved, is why does he go back here to this? Why does he do that? God came to Abraham, I'm going to make of your seed a great nation. They were a chosen people. You know, one could say, well, actually, they, they died in Egypt. I don't, I don't want to make more out of that than I should here in, in this current study that's not the purpose of the study today we but we could develop that more fully if we look at it but in type they died in Egypt and they were redeemed and they came out of Egypt as a redeemed uh, people a redeemed nation but it was a mixed multitude I'm going to suggest that in our present text the brethren and our forefathers are God's elect I know that, that more than God's elect came out of Egypt, but what came out of Egypt in one sense was an elect nation. What came out in another sense was an, an elect people. He did choose the nation of Israel, and he's, he's dealt with the nation of Israel, and they came out of Egypt, out of bondage, out of slavery, along with a mixed multitude. And they all together 
those who were his elect people and those who were of the mixed multitude were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Now, whether they were God's elect or non-elect, they, they drank of the water, they ate of the manna, and, 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 and someone can preach a sermon on that. Undoubtedly, God's blessings fall on everybody. I mean, dearly beloved, we breathe His air, we drink His water, we eat His food, which He provides from the earth. It's all His. Everything is His. Everything we have is His. The majority of humans probably never stop to think that it's His air, His water, His sun, His rain, His, his wind, His world, His earth. And we all enjoy it. God Himself says He sends the rain on the just and the unjust. So they all did that. And they all passed through the sea and they were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. The word baptism means identification. Baptizo. To become identified with. It would be perfectly reasonable, rational, logical if you was a, a Greek scholar to translate this. They were all identified into Moses just as we are identified into Christ. None of them were immersed in water baptism. The only people that were covered with water were the Pharaoh's army. This is not language referring to water baptism by immersion. It's a type of God Almighty identifying His people in Moses and in the law. They were all identified into Moses. And it's an aorist passive. They had nothing to do with it. They had nothing to do with identifying themselves. What we do know is that they complained a lot. They complained a lot to Moses. Mostly they had fought against Moses and Aaron, but, but they, they did because God identified them into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now I believe that the present context shows that these are His people, elect, chosen, in Christ before the foundation of the world. But it, it also includes the mixed multitude that came out of Egypt with them. Now we're going to read that they all perished in the wilderness. At least the elect did. The subject, folks, is our forefathers. However, we know that the first generation of the nation perished in that 38 years that they roamed in the wilderness. It, you know, and if figures are, are correct, and I, I don't know, but it's just interesting to think of, in order for that generation to have, have all passed away by the time they went into the promised land, we have to average out uh, about 100 deaths a day. So we got 100 funerals every day for 38 years. You know, maybe, maybe that's why sometimes, you know, they had to remain in one place for a long period of time just to bury the, the bodies. I don't know. But, but let's back up a little bit, okay, and, and just, you know, and, and talk to Moses. You know, where are we going? Well, we're going out in the desert. Uh, uh, Moses, uh, I don't know, you know, whether you've thought about it or not, but there's about a million of us, you know, maybe more, maybe more than that, with men, women, children, uh, you know, let's see, just a glass of water a day each out in the desert. Well, then that's, that's, well, that's a lot of water. But then that's not, that, that's, that's a, yeah, that's a lot for all of us, but we're going out where? We're going out in the desert and we're going to drink. It says they, they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. I read one commentary that, that said that actually there are several who kind of hold to the belief that, there are, that these, they were so foolish that they, they believed that, that in that old Jewish tradition that there was a, a rock that followed them around and provided them water. I don't, I don't know that that's so foolish. I don't know that that's what happened. I, I wasn't there. You know, his explanation is that three times in 38 years the rock was struck and they had water. Well, boy, they didn't have a, a lot of water other times then. I'm not sure that striking the rock caused the flow of water that they followed. Perhaps that happened. Maybe a river, brook, something. I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. But the point is that God provided for His people 
in miraculous ways along their journey to the land that He promised them, God's people, God's chosen people. And they complained. A lot. He was with them always. He never left them. He guided, directed them. He protected them day and night for all that time. And yet, despite all this, they had to have some tangible, something, something physical that they could see and handle. And the same is true today. I'm referring to the golden calf, of course, which I believe, this is my personal belief, I believe that they worshiped that as the God that they knew, Jehovah. I do not believe that they exchanged their God, Jehovah, for another deity. You know, forget the movie Charleston Heston, the, what was it, Ten Commandments. Uh, they, di they, didn't, they just didn't much care to listen to Moses, to listen to God. Their rebellion was centered around a lot of doubt and fear and frustration over God's sovereign will and direction, His perfect provision. I'm, I'm sure it seemed pretty far from perfect to them, but it was. And the same is true today. Anyway, these people needed a lot of water. They needed it every day. It wasn't just the people, you know, you know they had their own not kids, they had their own flocks, you know, their animals. That's a lot of water, particularly in a desert. I have no problem with a literal rock shaped like a beehive, as, as some have su suggested, rolling across the desert following them that provided the water. I don't know. I'm not saying there was. I'm not saying there wasn't, but I'm surely not going to laugh at somebody who says that there was a rock that followed these people around. I think that's a perfectly reasonable idea. You know, the children of Israel were surrounded with miracles in a desert, and folks, so are we. Whether you know it or not, essentially you're living in a spiritual desert. And Christians, by the score, are starving for spiritual food. There's very little serious, honest Bible teaching. What does God say? And what did, what did God mean? And why is our subject here freedom and liberty? There was always a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night, but God provided their needs in an area that was, was full of hardship, starvation, and that's us today. The clouds of protection, the rock, the spiritual rock. The spiritual rock is our Bible. That's our source of protection, information, food, nourishment. We come here to feast on Christ, the Word of God. The Lord said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part in me. And that really sounds bad, but when you think about it, that's what we are. We're, we're rejoicing. We're feasting on the fact that Jesus Christ died in our place by the blood of His cross, that He's presented us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. I don't know whether that rock was, you know, kind of scooting along, you know, behind Him or not, but they had water every day. That's the point. They, they had a pillar of fire every night. They had a a cloud every day that they were protected from the heat of the, of the desert, the thirst of the desert, the cold of the night. They were always there in God's care. And that was Christ. Whether it's a, a cloud, pillar, or fire, or rock, whatever you want to say, it was Christ. And He supplied their spiritual needs. God wasn't trying to do that. He did do that, he's, and He's providing their spiritual nourishment. That's the primary inference of the text. Same is true today. And that, that's what we get from the Word of God, our spiritual nourishment. That's what they needed. That's what we need. Now, I believe that in actual fact, the type was real. They did drink. They did eat. They were protected in the desert. You and I are spiritually, through the Word of God, going through this desert, but with many of them, God was not well pleased. The word many there is articulated in the Greek, and I think the many refers once again to God's elect, to those who were God's people. 
In actual fact, he wasn't well pleased with any of that first generation, but God never talks about being pleased or displeased with those who are not His. In fact, folks, there's very little in Scripture that has much to say to the non-believer except for judgment. It has very little to say about those who are not His people. This book is written to us who are His children, who are the sheep of His pasture, those for whom He died, those whom He chose in Christ before the foundation of the world. So I believe that the, the many is like the many in Romans 5 when we went through the, our study in Romans. You know, for by the disobedience of the one, the many were made sinners. These are, these are, that's referring to God's elect. With God's elect, He was not well pleased. For they were cut down in the wilderness. Let's go back. Lest I be disqualified. That's what Paul said. I don't want this. In fact, in fact, the purpose of this text is to tell us that we are not to use our liberty in the wrong way. Now, let's think about that for a minute. Lie not one to another, seeing you put off the old man with his deeds. Doesn't that infer that you could lie? You know, uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Doesn't that infer that you could walk unworthily? Take heed how you build on Christ. Doesn't, doesn't that infer that you could build wood, hay, stubble? Well, of course it does. There is a liberty that can be used to excess. We're going to see that, that, that uh, all of these things were examples for us. Now, now, I've preached heavily on God's sovereignty, and that's something that you have to wrestle with. Could it have been any other way? Could it, could it have been that they reached the border of the Promised Land and they all went in rejoicing? Well, sure, could have, but it didn't turn out that way. They refused to go in and they wandered for 38 more years in the wilderness until that generation died out. Did, did it have to work out that way? Well, the argument of the text seems to say that they, they, they could have done it differently, but they didn't. And, and it was, by design, an example for us. So, so what is that example? The text says, so that we should not lust after evil things as they did. Clearly, that infers that we can lust after evil things. In fact, I think every single one of you who has an ounce of common sense realizes that, that well, that, that thing happens all the time. Could it have been any other way? God says, I need an example. I need an example. So it happened this way by accident? D did, he, did He violate their free, so-called free will, their choice? No, He didn't. Is it really that tough, folks, to believe? That, that God does use the unbelief, the doubt, the worries, the fears, the griping, the complaining, the sinning, the rebellion in our lives to assist others? while still holding, God's still holding them accountable for what they did. It's not that they, they don't have any excuse. In the final analysis, is that what, is that what you wanted to do? Well, some, you know, well, yeah, yeah, I chose to do that. It's my fault. And every one of you has had the situation, uh, at least one situation like that. What, it ha had, what would have happened if David had not committed adultery, okay, and murder? Well, a big part of the Bible would be missing for one thing. It was a wonderful lesson for us. But could David, could David stand up and say, well, I did something I didn't want to do? No. It's exactly what he wanted to do. These things are our examples, and they were made an example. Passive voice were made by someone here, and it wasn't us. God, it was God. Examples. Now, one could argue that they weren't forced to do it that God is saying He's using them. It's, it's God who's He's making use of what they did, who's making what they did an example for us. On the other hand, in the sovereignty of God, you could argue that it is God who made them to do what they did so that we, you and me, should not lust after evil things as they did. 
it's an amazing insight uh, to me into the love that God has for us. Imagine what an example to, to imagine an example to teach us not to desire evil things. What an example. I mean, how important is it to God that we not desire evil things? Just read the chapter. Just read, read the account of the Exodus. You know, we're stunned to think that a whole nation could roam for 38 more years in the desert and the wilderness, and yet the, and yet the flip side of that coin is, is for 38 more years He fed them, He cared for them, He clothed them, He took care of them, He loved them. More and more they would have had the, the, the constant daily proof, the reminders that it was God who was providing for them. So even though they were made an example for us, they also had a tremendous opportunity to learn lessons of God's grace. God's provision, God's protection, God's direction, God's everything. And don't let it slip your nose that what we see they did, they did as those under law. And here we are being commanded not to do as they did and that as people under grace. We are not under law as a rule of life. We're not motivated by that. But love. The strength of sin is the law, folks, whether you want to believe that or not. And that, that is true, whether you're an Israelite in the desert or you're a member of the body of Christ living in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay? Neither, verse 7, let us be idolatrous as, as were some of them, as it is written, the people eat down, sit down, they sit down to eat and they get up to play, rise up to play. That's, that's an interesting translation. Most of you are familiar with the golden calf that Aaron made. They sat down to eat and drink and they rose up to praise God, to worship God. They're worshiping that calf as though it's the Lord. The problem is they wanted some tangible, solid thing that they could, they could grasp onto. A golden calf, you know, many Christians want that. They want some kind of a miracle. They want something tangible, physical, that they can grasp onto. You know, I, I know God is there because of a sign I saw in that sky. I, I know God is there because of a dream I had. Or, or anything, but anything but. Well, I, I know that God's true because He said it. Okay, there, therefore, I trust Him. I don't know what God's plan is for your life, folks. I don't know what God has ordained for you, but you can trust Him. Do you have to see it in order to believe it? Do you have to hold it in your hand? Do you have to hold it in order to know that it's true? Miracles in the Scriptures are things that were used to bear testimony to the truth of God's Word. Not the truth of His love and concern for you, but the truth of His Word. And the last great display of miracles is going to be by Satan. So please don't look forward to those. Why do we need that? Why can we not be satisfied with just trusting and believing in a God who says that He will never leave us nor forsake us, that He'll provide our needs and direct our steps. He knows the paths we take when He's testing us will come forth as gold. He bottles our tears. His Word is all we need. That we need to know that His work was sufficient, that His, His ongoing work in our lives is perfect. But, but, the, but the inference is we could just lust, lust after evil things. You know, we, we could be idolaters. We could commit fornication and, and even tempt Christ as some of them also tempted Christ and were destroyed of, surf, of serpents. Okay. Many people don't seem to realize they tempted Christ simply because they didn't believe Him. They didn't trust Him. They didn't, they didn't rely on Him. You've led us into the wilderness to destroy us? God hasn't led you any place to destroy you. He's led you to teach you, to support you, to open your heart and your mind to the wonders of His grace and of His great love for you. Don't murmur. Don't complain. People do murmur against God. You know, well, if God really loved me, you know, this wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened. Oh, don't do that, dearly beloved. Don't do that. God has declared He's working in you to will and to do of His good pleasure. He's not a liar. He says He's directing your steps. He's not a liar. 
He says he's working things together for your good. He doesn't lie, folks. Don't tempt him. These things happened for an example to us. God is using what happened. I personally believe He ordained it to happen. You, know, you don't have to agree with that, but that's what I believe. What you can say is it happened. And He's going to use it as an example for us. I believe He ordained it to be an example for us. And we can see His love, His mercy, His grace, His, His patience, His concern in actually using His people back then to teach us this great spiritual lesson today. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, rest in Him. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.